This is the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast, session number 259, Stop It, with Richard Nongard and Jason Lynette. Welcome to the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast with Jason Lynette, your professional resource for hypnosis training and outstanding business success. Here's your host, Jason Lynette. What I want you to do is consider all the various phrases that somehow have become a bit of a bad habit in your hypnosis and stop it. Hey, it's Jason here, and this week's episode began as a quick video that Richard Nongard put up online in the ICBCH forum, which if I can get clever and figure out how to pull down the video and put it in the show notes, I'll do that. If not, we'll definitely link over to the specific post in the show notes here at the Work Smart Hypnosis website. But the origin story of this was Richard going off on the phrase, what I want you to do is, and giving some really insightful thinking as to why it's a phrase that perhaps we should eliminate from the hypnotic process, to which then became a Facebook chat between the two of us of me going, well, what about this one? What about that one? And the result became this week's podcast episode of talking about four specific patterns that will put them in the category, yes, of best practices, that if you say these things, it's not going to necessarily make or break your session or cause it to not work or cause the very, very specific outcome that one of Richard's students experienced as a result of one of these phrases. But instead, you're going to find a much more consistent outcome by just using, again, the language that we ought to be using in the world of professional hypnotism which we're going to jump directly into this conversation here in a bit. And yes, we're also pointing out the better phrasing to often use, the better tonality, the better intention, and some rather colorful stories. And who knew that the Jingle Bell song could be that traumatic? This episode is also a bit of a preview of a four-day event that Richard and I are training together in Las Vegas in August of 2020, prior to the HypnoThoughts Live convention. It's happening Monday to Thursday, August 10th to 13th, and it is our ICBCH professional hypnosis training and certification, which you can find all the details about this upcoming event over at Vegas hypnosistraining.com. We'll link to that over in the show notes at worksmarthypnosis.com. But this is a four-day training course, and it's a combination live and online event for people who are brand new to hypnosis to learn the skills of professional hypnosis and achieve membership and certification with the ICBCH, one of the largest growing hypnotic organizations out there with thousands of members worldwide. But it's not just for the new hypnotist. It's also for those of you that are out there that are perhaps already working and perhaps wanting to level up your game with evidence-based strategies and just basically to make use of the 45 plus years of experience that Richard and I are there to com combine together to share with you as part of this event, which as a side note, as Richard talks about the theme of onboarding, this timing of the event as the pre-conference offering prior to the HypnoThoughts Live convention is that kind of perfect combination of learning from the two of us, establishing that baseline and strength of those skills, and then widening, widening that knowledge even further with the biggest and best convention we used to say in the country, but now not even in the world, but as I like to say, yes, indeed, in the galaxy. So far, we can prove that statement to be true, given knowledge that we know. So you can find the details of HypnoThoughts Live at htlive.net. The convention pre-class that Richard and I are doing is available online at Vegas hypnosistraining.com. Plus, check out the rest of the schedule. I know Richard's doing another post-conference. I'm doing one on business building. There's all sorts of opportunities, and it's a great way to just combine all the efforts together. So check that out, vegashypnosistraining.com. We've got students coming from all over the world. So with that, let's jump into this week's episode with all sorts of strategies to make your hypnosis even better. Here we go. Episode number 259, Stop It, with Richard Nongard and Jason Lynette. Hey, Richard, wanted to get your advice on this before we get started. I've got this fear of being buried alive in a box. Uh, what do you think I should do? Well, you know, I've worked with a lot of people who have a fear of being buried in a box, and uh, I'm going to tell you what I have told them that's always worked, and that is stop it. Oh, okay. Good. Problem solved. Hey, welcome, everybody. This week, Richard and I are joining together for a bit of a two-headed podcast episode on, well, as we've called it, Stop It with Richard Nodgarn and Jason Lynette. And the whole concept of this was kind of inspired by a post that Richard put up in the ICBCH forum, but then expanding upon this in some conversations we were having and 
rather than sit there and pat ourselves on the back. Instead, let's share this dialogue with you of basically, here are four things that we feel hypnotists out there should stop doing, which if you don't have the running gag yet of the whole stop it routine, we'll put a link to this, we'll embed it in the show notes over at worksmarthypnosis.com. It's a comedy sketch from the TV show Mad TV with Bob Newhart. Hilarity would ensue, watch that clip on your own. But kind of set the stage for us before we get into these four concepts. Richard, for those that perhaps haven't yet met you, could you briefly introduce yourself, please? Uh, sure. I'm Richard Nongard, and I have written some of the best-selling books in the world of hypnosis. I've been doing hypnosis for 30 years, and I love all things hypnosis. So that's me in a nutshell. Yeah, and awesome. And really, the whole mindset of this is, you know, we kind of lead things up and organize with various events or even the ICBCH organization. The mindset of learning from people that you can actually book a session with, introduce the the local business that's there in Las Vegas. You know, I run Hypnosis Nevada, and it's a place where clients come to see me for life coaching and hypnotherapy, and I help people to achieve their dreams, to overcome the obstacles that are holding them back. And I have a specialty niche, and that is really areas of medical hypnosis, where the research has shown that hypnosis is an effective tool to help people recover faster, to overcome difficulties, and to prepare for difficult situations by being as healthy as they possibly can. Awesome. And I share that's probably the extent of interviewing that we get into in this week's episode is this this week is more about show rather than tell, rather than talk about ourselves. Instead, giving people the actual deliverables and some advice they can use to better advance their sessions, which I share. You and I are recording this a day where you're Hypnosis Nevada. I reversed it. I'm Virginia Hypnosis. Not that the order matters, apparently. But today's a day where practically everyone who's coming in, they're all public speaking clients. And actually, as I'm looking at our list of the four ideas we wanted to share and give some advice on, these are all things that perfectly fit into the context of the clients that I see today. So Richard, let's kick it off. For the first point, what I'd like you to do is share what you think that phrase is that people should stop using as, as hypnotists. I think every hypnotist should banish this phrase from their repertoire of scripts that they use or communications in a hypnosis session. And those seven words are, what I want you to do is. And the reason why is simple. This is a bad habit that we get into as we are new hypnotists. It's really a filler, just like um or ah. And so in a hypnosis session, we preface what our direct suggestion is or the experience we'd like to create with that filler word. But instead of um or ah, we say, what I would like you to do is... The problem with this is that then it becomes about what I want them to do. And hypnosis should always be about what they can do. And so the real crux of the matter isn't that it's just a filler word like um and ah, but that it actually disempowers the client. And we should always be using language that gives them full ownership of their experience so that it's not something I want them to do, but rather something that they're creating from within. And that way they are getting all of the benefits from hypnosis that are possible. So if those are the words to not use, what about the phrasing of, and take this moment and allow yourself to take a deep breath in and as you breathe on out and so forth. So the phrasing of allow yourself to notice that you have the ability to, what, what would you suggest that they use instead? Those are, those are actually great permissive phrases. You're giving them ownership with that. By the way, we can still be direct. So I could say to you, Jason, if you were my client and I was doing a session with you, what I want you to do now is close your eyes. Or I can simply be directive and say, now, Jason, close your eyes. Mm -hmm. It actually, they're both a direct suggestion. But we've removed that filler language, that language that disempowers the client. And now when they respond to the direct suggestion by closing their eyes, it was actually them who made that decision to follow along. So, so there's no problem with direct suggestion. The problem is literally the language pattern that disempowers the client of what I want you to do is. You know, that's something that I've always called out in my training events, and I'm not really ever thought of it as that filler word pattern, but I think you're exactly right on that, that I flash back to a moment where I attended a training with Terry Stokes, who Terry's actually doing the stage show this year in August 2020 at Hypno Thoughts Live. And he taught an extremely direct induction method for a group of volunteers on stage. And when it came time to practice in the event, 
there's a moment that really stood out as people were getting up and adding a whole bunch of extra stuff to the beginning of the technique that here's the technique now go practice it please and there was this beautiful moment where terry said why are you doing all that extra breathing stuff at the beginning and the person came up with some ideas as to uh, it builds rapport it relaxes them and terry just goes no it's because you're afraid to get started just Absolutely. do the technique that's enough and that just called out this beautiful you know thing in my mind of you know, we, we notice this sometimes where there's a lot of extra filler. And I think I've called out in previous sessions that we often would have that moment where someone, you know, maybe here's a technique that doesn't go exactly as planned. And we then find the intention to then do a little bit of extra stuff to play the game of preventative maintenance. But if we keep that up, eventually, and it's not for the sake of, you know, louder, faster, funnier, it's not for the sake of cutting out the extra time of the session. It's just greater efficiency in the work. What stood out to me about the phrase, what I want you to do is, is that it just seems more practitioner centered. Follow my instructions. Do what That's I'm exactly, telling you. That's exactly what the problem is. You know, this whole discussion came about on the ICBCH forum on Facebook because I was doing a supervision session with a very experienced hypnotist. Uh, he's been a hypnotist for more than 10 years, and he was a little bit rattled. He had a client uh, a week or two ago that was referred by a psychiatrist and basically walked out of the session halfway through the session. Oh, basically, wow. You know what? This is a waste of my time, and I, I don't understand uh, what you're doing. This is of no benefit to me, and so good day, and, and literally got up and walked out. Again, this is an experienced practitioner. He's been doing this for more than more than 12 years. And he said, you know, it just really rattled me. And so I asked him, I, I said, well, imagine I'm your client. And so I want you to do a session with me. And so he began doing the session with me. And I noticed that two or three times what he had said was what I want you to do is his technique was good. His ideas were good. His cadence, his rhythm, his tone were good. He had uh, empathy. He had good eye contact rapport. I mean, all of those things, but, but in the context of a resistant client, mm, yeah. what I want you to do is gives a person who is who has an internal resistance to change an out. Well, I don't want you to do what you want me to do. And so I'm not going to do it. And that's really all an unconscious process. And I, I actually think the reason that client walked out because everything else he does was exceptional was because that phrase challenged their autonomy. They took it at the literal and deepest level. What I want you to do is, and this person got up and left because they didn't want to do what the hypnotist wanted. They mm -hmm. wanted probably for the first time in their own life to feel a sense of self-efficacy and empowerment and the ability to do things on their own. Removing that lazy phrase, that filler language, not only makes us, I think, sound better, but also helps us to really empower the client. And it's really easy to do. We can ask clients using the language you said, the experience. So if I were to do a session with you, and as you close your eyes, you'll notice the sense of relaxation in the eyelids. Are you able to create that sensation? Right. And so again, I'm with the client. I'm doing something with them rather than something to them. And I think it just makes all the difference in the world. I think it's a, a, a phrase that we should all practice banishing. And anytime we catch ourselves using that phrase, what I want you to do when you catch yourself using that <laughs> phrase is think about what alternative you could have used and start practicing those. You know, I'm laughing because the end of the day appointment that I had yesterday was a moment where this guy had every bit of positive expectation coming into it. He had been referred by multiple people to me. He had known of me for years, given some local business groups that I've often spoken at. And what happens was as just as we're about to begin the session, and, and granted, this is a very rare moment for me, he suddenly goes, well, how is this going to work for me if I tend to be an argumentative person? To which I decided not to challenge it right away, but instead just to kind of play dumb and go, just so I'm clear, what does that have to do with fill in the blank issue? And he goes, oh, nothing really, but I just tend to be that person who's always looking for a reason why something's not going to work for me. To which now I respond, I, I have to ask you, then why are you here? Which then we smoothed over the moment and in the middle of which I did begin, I, I teach this in the training that you know, I don't say per classify your client as either needing a permissive or an authoritative approach. Instead, we can be permissively authoritative or authoritatively permissive. We can fire off both at the same time. That admittedly with this guy, I began a little bit more permissive, but as soon as we were in sync, as soon as we had hypnotic phenomenon in motion, here comes that beautiful moment where his arm is locked. 
And as he's looking at his hand, he can't bend it, which pays off an even greater moment of realizing, oh, this is different. It's at this point now, as he's got the arm lock, playing the game of, yeah, you're doing great. Fantastic. <laughs> Any final thoughts on what I want you to do is before we move to the next one, Richard? No, what I want you to do, Jason, is I want you to move to the next uh language pattern that we want to eliminate from our vocabulary. Awesome. So this one isn't necessarily a specific phrase. It's something that let's follow the trend of let's call them filler words or filler phrases, where the new student would often be guilty of delivering what I now nickname two bold suggestions. Suggestions that come across as way too strong in terms of where they are in the process, or perhaps even, you know, what stands out as being logical given the session. The most obvious one is that I often hear in a practice session, and right now you are the most relaxed you have ever been in your entire life. Which Double every- relaxation by 10 billion. Well, that too, yeah. <laughs> which as soon as I hear that, oh, I have to go off on that one in a moment, the numbers. As soon as I hear the you are now the most relaxed you've ever been in your entire life, my first cynical thought clicks in to go, how do you know? And then the playful part of the mind wanders off to go, well, you know, there was this one time eight years ago on that vacation. So there's something to be said about firing off the phrase that's much too bold. Instead, you can soften it quite easily. You are now more relaxed than you've been in quite some time, more relaxed than you've been since you've noticed this issue, something of that nature to leave a little bit more of a vague opening for them to fill in the details themselves. I I love what you mentioned there about you are now 10 billion times relaxed, which some of you may laugh at that, but it's very often the stage hypnotist or maybe those who have seen stage hypnosis that use that phrase, which you know, let, let's use the simple metaphor of standing by the edge of a swimming pool or perhaps the edge of a cliff. You can look down and you can measure what it would be to be 100 foot down, you know, from the top of a mountain to the base of it. But it's hard to measure that idea of 10 billion times deeper. You can stand on the side of a swimming pool and you can look down and understand that that's now 10 foot deep into the water. I'm sorry for the pun because that's a depth that you can fathom. <laughs> uh, sorry about that <laughs> so any thoughts on that too bold suggestion pattern absolutely i think that hypnotists have this theory that i need to share my confidence with my clients by giving them bold suggestions i should also accept my expectations for my clients outcomes and successes high in order to paste them into success and there's some value in that The reality, though, is that we become unrealistic Mm -hmm. with our clients when we give suggestions that are simply too bold, unfathomable, or quite frankly, unreachable. You know, the the suggestion and in your mind's eye, you know, you'll see yourself as the skinniest you've ever been. Well, I mean, at one point I was seven pounds, 11 ounces. (laughs) So, And you're looking great these days, but you're not quite there yet, Richard. (laughs) Right, right, right. (laughs) I still have a, a, you know, 195 pounds to lose to get back to my birth weight. But I, again, these these suggestions that, that are too bold to the point where they are either unrealistic or unhelpful become suggestions that cause, like you said, the conscious mind to kick in to question the validity of that. Which I've got a real story and I'm looking back in my notes here and somehow wondering how in almost six years of this podcast, I've never told the story that a student of mine calls up and the client is coming in because they're getting like, as she put it, this quote, PTSD style reaction whenever people hear the happy birthday song, which just to shorten the story, something happened. And I actually had someone years ago that it was the same thing, but with jingle bells. And again, keep it simple, something happened. And she's now asking me, by the way, it's I shot the sheriff, but you didn't shoot the deputy. Mine used to be wonderful tonight that I used to uh, work with my parents doing uh, wedding photography. And in the mid 1990s, every couple was doing their first dance to wonderful tonight, which is actually the song Eric Clapton wrote about the night that he slept with George Harrison's wife. So um, enjoy your wedding. Meet the best man. That aside, the question was, I think that's true. The question was uh, how, you know, based on a hypnotic depth scale, how deeply hypnotized do you think I have to get this guy to convince him now that's his favorite song? I'm like, that's a bit too far of a jump to go from this song makes me break out in cold sweats and hate everything around me to now suggesting this is now your favorite song. When we kind of roundabout way talked about when I did stage hypnosis, 
And this is now going about, about, you know, about eight, nine years ago. And I'd work with high schools and these kids had this love hate relationship with pop music. They either love Taylor Swift or they hate her. They either love Ariana Grande or they hate her. They all hate Justin Bieber now, but whatever the person was. But then again, are there songs that we know that we just kind of tolerate? Are there songs that we know that we go, oh yeah, I know that song. So it was too bold of a suggestion to go for, this is now your favorite song. And instead, take it to that level of, oh yeah, I recognize that song, but now there's no more emotional reaction to it. And in the context of hypnotic pain control, you know, the great thing about hypnotic pain control is that it's the one area where we have more evidence-based research showing the applications and efficacy of hypnosis and really any other area. So we know that hypnosis for hypnotic pain control is highly effective. But when I have somebody who's suffered chronic pain for a long period of time, the expectation that at the end of my first session, they will have no pain is really one unrealistic and two probably not that helpful but if i can help them to reduce their pain level from a level 10 to a level eight that probably makes a difference between able to get out of bed today or not and if i can reduce it from an eight to a six that probably makes a difference between being able to go to work today or not and if i can reduce it to a four from a six to a four that probably makes a difference in the ability to have and maintain healthy relationships on a day-by-day basis and so what we see here is that it's not all or nothing we can measure success incrementally and that can be of a tremendous benefit to a client. It lets them scale their experiences into perspective and it becomes far more realistic. Which there's something to be said about getting leverage that as soon as we have that, you know, sort of theoretical hypnotic foot in the door that something's in motion, it's an even easier step to then go even further into that change. Which Exactly. I can move from a, a 10 to an eight, then the question has to be asked inside can I move from an eight to a six? And you can do that quickly or you can do that slowly, but you'll discover that by continuing to practice the methods you've learned, that these promises can come true for you. Look at you stepping into hypnotic language patterns. Nicely done. Uh, Which by the way, Richard was talking research. Back October, 2019, he was on the podcast back then, episode 237, Hypnosis Research You Must Know About which will give you a shortcut to go check out that episode and see some of this research, just simply go to worksmarthypnosis.com forward slash research. That's where you can find all that data that's been collated with some really cool studies that are referenced there, ones that I've actually put on the new Virginia Hypnosis website. And while you're there too, part of why we're gathered here together today is that coming up in August 2020, just prior to the HypnoThoughts live convention, Richard and I are joining forces to do the ICBCH Professional Hypnosis Certification and Training Program. That's happening the four days before that conference. You can find all the details over at VegasHypnosisTraining.com. And for those of you that are brand new to hypnosis, it's a great opportunity to learn from two leaders in the profession and learn the techniques of professional hypnosis and uh, evidence-based approach in terms of starting a career, helping others. And even for those of you that are already working in hypnosis, looking to level up your game with some, again, evidence-based strategies and techniques to get out there and really help people. So any thoughts you could share on that upcoming class, Richard? I'm really looking forward to the class because a ton of people have gotten their start with the ICBC certification program. We really view the basic first certification course as an opportunity to launch a career as a hypnotist. We want to support the opportunities for people to pursue hypnosis as either a part-time or full-time endeavor and to be successful at it. So we lay the foundation for the skills that are necessary and The the great thing about this foundation is I've been doing this for 30 years. That's actually a long time to do hypnosis. And you've been doing this for more than a decade. So we got, you know, 45 years, let's say, experience between the two of us. So we know what works and what doesn't work. And when they come to the class, we're going to distill the the most effective routes that they can take to both business and clinical success based on not having to do the trial and error that we had to go through. You know, back in the day when I learned hypnosis, I never took a hypnosis certification class. Uh, They they largely didn't exist at that time. What that meant was that I had to do trial and error. I couldn't cut to the chase. I had to learn things the hard way. And our course is going to make it easy for people to attend who attend 
to create success, both in outcomes and in the business of actually seeing clients. Yeah, and we've got a great crew of people coming together already from genuinely all over the world. A lot of hands-on practice. This is a hybrid course, which is combining online education as well as the live four days together. You can grab one of those early admission spots and we've got payment plans available. Check it out. Hypnot is over at Vegas Hypnosis Training. Dot com And plus, that's going to give you a discounted link to sign up actually for the HypnoThoughts convention and expand that learning even further, which let's move to the third point here of other things to stop it. You've got another phrase that we should cut out of our language. So I often hear hypnotists say either in describing hypnosis to people on the phone or in workshops and training or even to clients. And the phrase is now that you are in hypnosis or uh, now that you are under hypnosis, the, I think the under hypnosis probably gets under my skin more than anything else because I just don't like that metaphor of being under. It makes me feel claustrophobic, if you will. But you know, we can I work on that. Yeah, I, <laughs> I wonder if I can find a hypnotist to help me. We'll see. But it uh, makes me feel like an underground in a in a box. There you go. We're buried underground. Stop Jason. it. So, so under hypnosis or in hypnosis are two phrases that I think we should banish. I had a hypnotist call me the other day, again, an experienced hypnotist, a stage hypnotist moving into clinical hypnosis. And he said, look, I got a call from somebody and they wanted to know what happens if I don't get hypnotized. And he said, I didn't really have a, a really good answer for him. And I said, well, your answer should be. Uh, that's not possible. Everybody who comes to my office experiences hypnosis. And the reason why is because hypnosis is not something I am doing to you. Hypnosis is something I am doing with you. And then go on and explain to the client that we all experience trance all day long, every day. We are literally in trance 24 hours a day. We're in our sleeping trance, our learning trance, our listening trance, our driving trance, our anger trance, our relaxation trance, our reading trance, our television trance, our play with the dog trance. The question in the office is not, can I hypnotize you? The question is, can I teach you how to utilize these naturally occurring trance phenomena. And so the real issue is what Milton Erickson called, actually, uh, it was, um, gosh, I can't remember the name of his cohort who wrote the book, Psychobiology of Immune System Response. But, but Stephen Gilligan also used this phrase, trance utilization. The real question is not, can I hypnotize you? But in the time that we have, can I share with you how to utilize the naturally occurring trance states so that you can use the resources that you have within you in a way to help you live a better life? The answer to that is yes. And so I never used the phrase when you are in hypnosis or when you go under hypnosis, because I just don't view hypnosis as something that is not natural phenomena. All hypnotic phenomena happens without hypnosis taking place or without a hypnotist taking place. What we're really doing in hypnosis is directing our clients to an ability to choose the trance state that's going to be most resourceful to them. And so when I do hypnosis correctly, I'm sharing a trance with them. I'm doing something with them. I'm not doing something to them. That makes it far easier for me, far more empowering for them and creates much better outcomes. And I got to Google while you were uh, chatting there, psychobiology of mind, body, healing, Ernest Rossi. In my, Ernest, book, Rossi. In my book. Uh, Ernest Rossi and Milton Erickson wrote some books together. They were contemporaries. And I think trans utilization was actually his language, if I'm correct. So if not under hypnosis or in hypnosis, I'm kind of okay with in hypnosis. I'm definitely opposed to under hypnosis with one exception. You're my client and you're in front of me the second week and you walk in and you say to me, wow, that was amazing. I got up on the platform and I spoke and I felt so confident. I felt so in control. And I got to tell you, last week while I was under hypnosis, I felt so relaxed. Now I'm going to go, oh, it's okay with this person. And I'll simply respond, good. And this week while you're under hypnosis. <laughs> so I may utilize it if, if they demonstrate a comfort with it. Not common sense. You know, we utilize the language of our client, but I might seize it as an opportunity to really empower the client. If you came into me, Jason, and you said, last week when I was under hypnosis, it was really helpful and I accomplished my objective this week. I might say, I, I might even say to you, well, let, let me correct you here. You, you weren't actually under hypnosis. What you were was utilizing the resources that are already within you. You, you learned how to uh, how to directly control both your physical experience of anxiety and being in front of a crowd and the 
psychological capacity to be confident and deliver your message with passion. And so it wasn't anything that I did to you, but actually something you allowed yourself to do. And we're going to build on that this week because you're going to learn even more things. So again, I'm not sure there's really a wrong way to do it, but I I hear it misused all the time. And I think there are hypnotists who actually believe that they are doing something to the client. Mm -hmm. They believe that they are hypnotizing them. We're not hypnotizing anyone. We're sharing trance space. This is what rapport and unconscious rapport and collective consciousness is all about. I really view myself as doing something with them, not something to them. Yeah, which in many ways we can look at some of these things. Well, it's where if you use the phrase, what I want you to do is if you deliver the two bold suggestion, if you use the phrase under hypnosis, or even if you do the fourth thing that we're about to talk about, chances are it's still going to be effective. But we can- what I want you to do is I want you to double the sense of relaxation by 10 billion and go under hypnosis. <laughs> And move to the fourth point. And chances are, if you did those things, you may still get the result. We'll put these into the category of best practices, that if we operate in the better phrasing, we're going to get better results. But as we talk about this fourth thing, Richard, I want you to think about the most confident you have ever been in your entire life. That's right. Just feel that excitement, that excitement just bursting at the seams. You feel so good. That's right. Which clearly the fourth thing is now the wrong tonality, where the you know, the question of what is the appropriate tona- tonality for hypnotic suggestion? And this is a riddle that, you know, I'll ask this in Vegas to our students. I'll often ask this in my own events. And I get the different responses at first. And it's a trick question because at first they'd go like, you know, smooth and relaxing or confident and direct. And the proper answer is what is the appropriate tonality of hypnotic suggestion? whatever is appropriate for the suggestions that are being given. So it's where if I'm trying to drive you to a place of relaxation, I'm going to bring the voice to that calm place and bring you along for the ride. But if there's that moment where now that you feel that excitement rising and you're there on that platform and as you're delivering those words, you can feel that excitement rising throughout you as you're looking out into the faces of the people in the crowd and that's encouraging you even greater, even stronger. And it's where I did this one time at a a meetup I attended And as soon as I did that delivery, someone goes, yeah, but if you talk that way, you're going to wake the people up. And luckily, the entire room laughed the way that you did. And oftentimes, that happens as early as day one of our classes. (laughs) I think it's new hypnotists who don't know these things, and they're afraid. What if somebody opens their eyes? What if somebody quote unquote, wakes up. These are not concerns. These are are normal experiences and people should be at a variety of different levels of awareness. There's a big myth in our profession that the deepest level of trance is the best level of trance. And so at various times, I want them to experience various levels of trance. The other thing that you talk about when you are talking about the incorrect tonalities, I I think it's related to the belief that I should have some mystical hypnotic voice. Mm -hmm. Years ago, I decided that I would just use my regular voice as my hypnosis voice. So if you listen to a recording I do, I speak with the same tone, the same language, the same pace, the same everything in a class on a hypnosis recording in a session or, you know, to my, to my family members. I, I use my normal voice. I don't try to create a hypnotic tone. And I do notice something. It does seem to be the old hypnotists. And again, I'm, I'm old, so I could qualify as an old hypnotist, but it's the old hypnotists who back in the day really believed they needed to develop this hypnotic voice. And sometimes it's almost humorous yes. because there are people <laughs> I know who are very skilled hypnotists, but when I actually see them do a session, they'll suddenly modulate and change their voice and their tone and their speed. And it it comes across as almost comical to me. I actually want to burst out laughing. Yeah, it actually reference something that now has greater context for some of the people listening out there, that there's a friend of mine who's a magician and mentalist, sort of mind reading magic show that just a few weeks ago, we were out in Vegas for the ICBCH convention. And it was actually Alan Nu, who I brought about 60 of us to go see. And he was actually on this podcast back July, I've got it open in front of me, July 2015, episode 48, but who's counting? And it's where I heard someone asked him one time, when you perform, what's your character? Now, his is very clearly entertainment, and he's doing you know, a show on a stage with lighting. And I loved Alon's answer, which was that, what's your character? He goes, well, it's me, but I just talk louder because there's an audience in front of me, and that way they can hear me. <laughs> 
absolutely brilliant. That again, using the appropriate tonality for the suggestions that are being given. If we want to bring someone to an excitable state, the the classic phrase, whether it's we want to say it's NLP, whether we want to say it's out of acting, is you go first. I, I saw one time a stage hypnotist, and I can't remember who this was. This wasn't like a hypnosis convention, but like the process was so relaxing during his induction, but whatever he said, the word relax, it kind of sounded like a yappy chihuahua barking at that point. And you saw the volunteers kind of perk up and kind of be a little thrown off by that, which to his credit, he kept all of his volunteers and did a fantastic show, uh, <laughs> which goes to show you that again, this process is a lot less delicate than what you would often expect that, you know, we can sometimes say the wrong thing and still get the result. We can use perhaps not the best tonality and still be effective. Any other thoughts on that tonality as well? I have no further thoughts on that subject. <laughs> you know, I feel so confident now that you've said that, which this is a bit of a preview of some of the through lines, some of the bigger overriding arcs of what we're going to be sharing at this upcoming event, which again, the details are online at Vegas hypnosis training.com. You can find all the dates, timing and details and pricing over on that website. But the students who leave that event receive certification and membership with the ICBCH, the International Certification Board of Clinical Hypnotherapists. And Richard, just briefly, for those that are not familiar with that group, can you give a bit of a background and intro to them? Well, the ICBCH is probably the fastest growing and most member responsive organization representing hypnotists. And we try to provide the resources to members that will help them be successful, both Again, by supporting their clinical knowledge and their skill and their technical level as professional hypnotists, but also in the business of hypnosis, being able to provide answers for entrepreneurs that can truly help them to be successful in business is also a mission of the ICBCH, as well as really protecting our profession and addressing anything ranging from legislative issues to public education in hypnosis and the benefits of hypnosis. But everybody who takes our class becomes a member in the ICBCH and is really a great opportunity for those. I, I want to stop calling it hypnosis trainings. I want to start calling them hypnosis onboardings mm -hmm. because Again, it's really going to be the beginning of, yes, a comprehensive program that will give you the skill level you need to be success, but you will not be abandoned afterwards and left to fend for yourself. The ICBCH, its thousands of members, its worldwide reach is going to be there to support you as well as Jason and I. We're both hands-on instructors and try to build relationships with those who are beginning their career as professional hypnotists. Which the, again, the benefit of the phrase onboarding is that this becomes one of the more budget-friendly events that I know you and I both do, that this is happening just before the HypnoThoughts Live convention, where during the weekdays, if you sign up early enough, rooms are just $45 a night. The convention is very reasonable. It's a little bit more for the weekend stay during the conference. But that opportunity now to network with others in the profession, to get more of a sampling of other styles that are out there, and really an organization with thousands of members worldwide, hundreds of instructors around the world too, and that ability to jump into really helping people out and kicking off that career, helping others with the strength of hypnosis. Jason Lynette here, and once again, thank you so much for interacting with this program, for sharing it on your social media streams, and leaving your reviews online as well. And once more, head over to VegasHypnosisTraining.com. Learn the techniques that work, model the skills of professional hypnotism, and really help your clients and start a career with evidence-based strategies. And plus, as a benefit of the event, you'll leave with that certification with the ICBCH to really get out there and really start to help others with these outstanding skills of professional hypnosis. So check out the HypnoThoughts Live convention, htlive.net. However, respectfully, don't register on that website because once you sign up for VegasHypnosisTraining.com, you'll get a private email with a even further discounted registration link for that HypnoThoughts Live convention. All of it's happening in August of 2020. Check out those sites and we'll see you in Vegas. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast at WorkSmartHypnosis.com.
Hey, it's Jason here, and reading is lame and videos are awesome, so do this right now. Go ahead and click subscribe right here inside of this video, and that will link you to my YouTube channel, and you will be the first to find out as new information is shared here online. Click subscribe now, stay in touch. I look forward to hearing of your success very soon.